Same process that I just described happens in religion, pastors and priests, resistance to advancing truth because they've taught or written or preached a certain viewpoint for years, and if, and if that viewpoint isn't right, they'll feel guilty for having uh, enslaved some mind into a distorted uh, doctrinal or belief system about God. So you see the same resistance. Only the lovers of the truth, are, who, who love truth, are the ones and have a humble heart and can acknowledge that they're finite beings, and this is the position of Come and Reason Ministries. We have, we've always taken the position that, that we're finite beings, and that we don't know everything and that we want to love the truth and grow in the truth and advance in it as soon as our capacities are capable of discerning it. And so whatever we're teaching, we might have to modify, change, give this up, replace it with that. That's, that's the whole journey that I've been on my life. And we've always taken the position, I'm not here to tell any of you what to think. Don't believe because Dr. Jennings said it. If you decide to believe something because I presented it to you, you weighed it out for yourself, you look at the evidence, you come to your own conclusion. That's why you believe, not because, well, Jennings said it, that's a bad reason to believe anything. The lesson goes on to describe the case of a man who murders a woman and then is caught because he went to her grave feeling overwhelmed with guilt and asking out loud for this uh, deceased woman to forgive him, and they had a recording device and recorded it. And then the lesson goes on to say, of course, though none of us, we hope, has ever done anything as bad as what that young man did, we are all guilty. We have all done things we are ashamed of, things that uh, we wished we could undo but cannot. Thanks to Jesus and the blood of the new covenant, none of us has to live under the stigma of guilt. According to the text for today, there is, na- there is no condemnation against us. The ultimate judge counts us as not guilty, counts us as if we have not done the things that we feel guilty about. Did you, I heard the sighs. <sighs> Good. Good for you. Do you see this is Fantasy Island? This is not reality. This is what you get when you hold a position that's based on falsehood. When you, you can't discern truth as long as you cling to lies. You have to be willing to give the lie up to understand and move forward in the truth. And the lesson authors continue to cling to the lie that God's law functions like human law. And that guilt is legal guilt. And condemnation is judicial condemnation. It's not. It's none of it. It is true that we've all done things for which we feel guilt, for which we feel regret, and things we cannot undo. But the question, why did we do those things? Did any person that you know, including yourself, ever choose to be a sinner? Yeah. We'll put it another way. Did any of you ever have a choice not to be a sinner? Did any of you ever have the choice Adam and Eve had in Eden to starting out as a sinless being who could actually make a choice to never participate in sin? Did any of you have that choice? Understand, their complete premise is fraudulent. None of us start out guilty. We start out terminal, dead in trespass and sin. We born in sin, conceived in iniquity. We start with a condition we never chose that without remedy results in symptoms, and the Bible calls those symptoms sins. And without remedy, we continue in those symptoms and makes our condition worse, hardening our heart, searing our conscience, warping our characters, eventually cutting ourselves permanently off from God, and we ultimately die from the condition. That's our position. So condemnation doesn't come because we are sinners. Condemnation comes to all who refuse remedy. You remember the analogy, HIV infected man, woman, get together, have a baby born HIV infected, what did the baby do wrong? Nothing. Nothing, but the baby now is a condition that needs remedy. Without treatment, it will have symptoms and ultimately result in death. The baby grows up, can understand their circumstance, offered a free remedy, won't take it. While they're not condemned for having the condition, they are condemned for refusing the remedy. And they will die, not from the doctor who offered them the remedy, they'll die from the unhealed condition. That's how reality works. So Oswald Chambers wrote, in my utmost for his highest, sin is something I am born with and cannot touch. Only God touches sin through redemption. It is through the cross of Christ that God redeemed the entire human race from the possibility of damnation through the heredity of sin. 
God nowhere holds a person responsible for having the heredity of sin and does not condemn anyone because of it. Condemnation comes when I realize that Jesus Christ came to deliver me from this heredity of sin, and yet I refuse to let him do so. From that moment, I beget, begin to get the seal of damnation. This is condemnation, and, and he inserts, he's quoting now the Bible, John three nineteen. but he inserts, and the critical moment, back to the quote, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Condemnation comes when you reject the light, when you reject the truth, when you reject the healing, when you reject the salvation, that results in the condemnation, not having the condition. This is why Paul meant when he wrote that the wicked perish because they refuse to love the truth and thus be saved. That's why. It is by accepting the truth that lies are dispelled. We're one back to trust. We open the heart, the spirit comes in and we are transformed the old goes away and the new comes. What about the idea that the ultimate judge counts us not guilty? Is that what happens? No, that's not what happens, folks. It's again a false legal perversion, perversion, perversion of reality. What happens is the ultimate judge judges us as healed or not. So consider King David what happens when his name comes up and the devil, because this is what the devil does, he's the accuser, he will accuse David as a murderer and adulterer. What do you think happens uh, when the devil accuses? Does God say, well, let me see. Um, yes, uh, right here, right in the book of 2 Samuel, David actually committed adultery and, uh, and, and murdered Uriah. Uh, uh, oh my, uh, I, I thought David was a real friend of mine. Now wait just a minute here. Uh, hold on, Jesus, do you have anything to add here before I pass a verdict? And Jesus steps up to the Father and says, well, well yes, Father, um, um, you're actually looking at the wrong book there. Uh, you're, you're reading the Bible, and, and uh, here, take this book. It's the one I put my blood on. And, uh, and please use this and relook up David. So the Father grabs the, the book and opens it up, and David, son of Jesse, uh, okay, okay, here we are. David, son of Jesse. Oh, I see now. Born in Bethlehem of Mary, lived a sinless life, died on the cross. And the Father turns to the heavenly core with a big smile and says... Sorry for the confusion, folks. I, I had the wrong book there for a moment. Uh, King David uh, has a new record entered into the court, and, and his actual life is erased from the records, and in its place he is accredited uh, with the life of Jesus, and therefore I find no evidence at all that David ever committed sin or was guilty of any sin, and I declare him not guilty. Amen. <laughs> is this what you believe happens? That's what they're teaching. It's exactly what they're teaching. It's corrupt, it's fraudulent, it's disgusting. Any thinking person would look at this, it's, it's villainous. No, here's what actually happens. If you want to use a courtroom scene at all, if you want to use a courtroom scene at all, here's what happens. God looks at Satan and says, Satan, are you trying to pawn off your fake imposed law system as, my, my, as the way my kingdom runs? No one here believes your lies anymore. Of course, we all know the historic deeds of what David did, and those facts of history never change. What changed was David. He trusted me and received a new heart and right spirit, and the infection of fear and the selfishness has been purged. His spirit temple has been cleansed. He is now my friend, free from your lies and purified from your methods of selfishness. Your legal charges have no standing here. I rebuke you again. Next case. <laughs> That's what happens if you need a courtroom scene at all. How'd you like that? Yes. Don't buy into this penal legal corruption. It destroys minds. It incites fear. It's horrible. We are never declared by God not guilty. What we are declared, healed, restored, cleansed, perfected through Jesus Christ. But there's so many church entities who falsely pacify their uh, con constituents saying, and not really holding out healing as an option. You can confess, you can be saved once you have said, I, I believe in Christ. Any number of ways that you can kind of convince people that they're fine just the way they are is a, is a win for Satan. You deny the person the actual healing that needs to be done. And that's what Paul talked about at the end of time, that they have a form of godliness, 
but they deny the power thereof. There's no power to heal lives in that false penal system. You just cover it over and you remain corrupt. Yeah, the, rot, the candy coated rotten apple, that's right. So it is true that because of God's grace, because of living in a trust relationship with him, that God removes from our hearts and minds the guilt, shame, and fear that sin brings. But this is not a removal of legal guilt. It is the actual experiential guilt that we're relieved of and removed. Back to Sunday's lesson. 